Is not thy hand, O Almighty God, able to heal all the diseases of my soul, and by thy more and more abundant grace to quench even the lascivious motions of my sleep? Thou wilt increase thy gifts in me more and more, O Lord, that my soul may follow me to thee, wrenched free from the sticky glue of lust, so that it is no longer in rebellion against itself, even in dreams, that it neither commits nor consents to these debasing corruptions which come through sensual images and which result in the pollution of the flesh. For it is no great thing for the Almighty who is able to do more than we can ask or think, to bring it about that no such influence, not even one so slight that a nod might restrain it, should afford gratification to the feelings of a chaste person even when sleeping. This could come to pass not only in this life, but even at my present age. But what I am still in this way of wickedness, I have confessed unto my good Lord rejoicing with trembling in what thou hast given me, and grieving in myself for that in which I am still imperfect. I am trusting that thou wilt perfect thy mercies in me, to the fullness of that peace which both my inner and outward being shall have with thee when death is swallowed up in victory. Chapter 31 There is yet another evil of the day, to which I wish I were sufficient. By eating and drinking we restore the daily losses of the body until that day when thou destroyest both food and stomach, when thou wilt destroy this emptiness with an amazing fullness and will clothe this corruptible with an eternal incorruption. But now this necessity of habit is sweet to me, and against this sweetness must I fight, lest I be enthralled by it. Thus I carry on a daily war by fasting, constantly bringing my body into subjection, after which my pains are banished by pleasure. For hunger and thirst are actual pain. They consume and destroy like fever does, unless the medicine of food is at hand to relieve us. And since this medicine at hand comes from the comfort we receive in thy gifts, by means of which land and water and air serve our infirmity, even our calamity is called pleasure. This much thou hast taught me, that I should learn to take food as medicine. But during that time when I pass from the pinch of emptiness to the contentment of fullness, it is in that very moment that the snare of appetite lies baited for me. For the passage itself is pleasant. There is no other way of passing thither, and necessity compels us to pass. And while health is the reason for our eating and drinking, Yet a perilous delight joins itself to them as a handmaid, and indeed she tries to take precedence, in order that I may do for her sake what I say I want to do for health's sake. They do not both have the same limit either. What is sufficient for health is not enough for pleasure, and it is often a matter of doubt whether it is the needful care of the body that still calls for food, or whether it is the sensual snare of desire still wanting to be served. In this uncertainty my unhappy soul rejoices, and uses it to prepare an excuse as a defense. It is glad that it is not clear as to what is sufficient for the moderation of health, so that under the pretense of health it may conceal its projects for pleasure. These temptations I daily endeavor to resist, and I summon thy right hand to my help and cast my perplexities onto thee, for I have not yet reached a firm conclusion in this matter. I hear the voice of my God commanding, Let not your heart be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. Drunkenness is far from me, thou wilt have mercy that it does not come near me. But surfeiting sometimes creeps upon thy servant. Thou wilt have mercy that it may be put far from me. For no man can be continent unless thou give it. Many things that we pray for thou givest us, and whatever good we received before we prayed for it, we received it from thee, so that we might afterward know that we did receive it from thee. I was never a drunkard, but I have known drunkards made into sober men by thee. It was also thy doing that those who never were drunkards have not been, 
and likewise it was from thee, that those who have been might not remain so always. And it was likewise from thee, that both might know from whom all this came. I heard another voice of thine, Do not follow your lusts, and refrain yourself from your pleasures. And by thy favor I have also heard this saying, in which I have taken much delight. Neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we eat not are we the worse. This is to say that neither shall the one make me to abound, nor the other to be wretched. I heard still another voice, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. See here a soldier of thy heavenly army, not the sword of dust we are. But remember, O Lord, that we are dust, and that thou didst create man out of the dust, and that he was lost and is found. Of course he, the Apostle Paul, could not do all this by his own power. He was of the same dust, he whom I loved so much, and who spoke of these things, through the afflatus of thy inspiration. I can, he said, do all things through him who strengtheneth me. Strengthen me, that I too may be able. Give what thou commandest, and command what thou will. This man, Paul, confesses that he received the gift of grace, and that when he glories, he glories in the Lord. I have heard yet another voice praying that he might receive. Take from me, he said, the greediness of the belly. And from this it appears, O my holy God, that thou dost give it, when what thou commandest is to be done, is done. Thou hast taught me, good Father, that to the pure all things are pure. But it is evil for that man who gives offense in eating and that every creature of thine is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, and that meat does not commend us to God, and that no man should judge us in meat or in drink. Let not him who eats despise him who eats not, and let him that does not eat judge not him who does eat. These things I have learned, thanks and praise be to thee, O my God and Master, who knockest at my ears and enlightenest my heart. Deliver me from all temptation. It is not the uncleanness of meat that I fear, but the uncleanness of an incontinent appetite. I know that permission was granted Noah to eat every kind of flesh that was good for food, that Elijah was fed with flesh, that John, blessed with a wonderful abstinence, was not polluted by the living creatures, that is, the locusts on which he fed. And I also know that Esau was deceived by his hungering after lentils, and that David blamed himself for desiring water, and that our king was tempted not by flesh, but by bread. And thus the people in the wilderness truly deserve their reproof, not because they desired meat, but because in their desire for food they murmured against the Lord. Set down, then, in the midst of these temptations. I strive daily against my appetite for food and drink. For it is not the kind of appetite I am able to deal with by cutting it off once for all, and thereafter not touching it, as I was able to do with fornication. The bridle of the throat, therefore, must be held in the mean between slackness and tightness. And who, O Lord, is he who is not in some degree carried away beyond the bounds of necessity. Whoever he is, he is great. Let him magnify thy name. But I am not such a one, for I am a sinful man. Yet I too magnify thy name, for he who hath overcome the world intercedeth with thee for my sins, numbering me among the weak members of his body. For thy eyes did see what was imperfect in him, and in thy book all shall be written down. Chapter 32 I am not much troubled by the allurement of odors. When they are absent, I do not seek them. When they are present, I do not refuse them. And I am always prepared to go without them. 
At any rate, I appear thus to myself. It is quite possible that I am deceived. For there is a lamentable darkness in which my capabilities are concealed, so that when my mind inquires into itself concerning its own powers, it does not readily venture to believe itself, because what already is in it is largely concealed unless experience brings it to light. Thus no man ought to feel secure in this life, the whole of which is called an ordeal, ordered so that the man who could be made better from having been worse may not also, from having been better, become worse. Our sole hope, our sole confidence, our only assured promise is thy mercy. Chapter 33 the delights of the ear drew and held me much more powerfully, but thou didst unbind and liberate me. In those melodies which thy words inspire, when sung with a sweet and trained voice, I still find repose, yet not so as to cling to them, but always so as to be able to free myself as I wish. But it is because of the words which are their life that they gain entry into me and strive for a place of proper honor in my heart, and I can hardly assign them a fitting one. Sometimes I seem to myself to give them more respect than is fitting, when I see that our minds are more devoutly and earnestly inflamed in piety by the holy words when they are sung than when they are not. And I recognize that all the diverse affections of our spirits have their appropriate measures in the voice and song to which they are stimulated by I know not what secret correlation. But the pleasures of my flesh, to which the mind ought never to be surrendered, nor by them enervated, often beguile me, while physical sense does not attend on reason, to follow her patiently. But having once gained entry to help the reason, it strives to run on before her and be her leader. Thus in these things I sin unknowingly, but I come to know it afterward. On the other hand, when I avoid very earnestly this kind of deception, I err out of too great austerity. Sometimes I go to the point of wishing that all the melodies of the pleasant songs to which David's Psalter is adapted should vanish both from my ears and from those of the church itself. In this mood, the safer way seemed to me, the one I remember was once related to me concerning Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, who required the readers of the psalm to use so slight an inflection of the voice that it was more like speaking than singing. However, when I call to mind the tears I shed at the songs of thy church at the outset of my recovered faith, and how even now I am moved, not by the singing, but by what is sung, when they are sung with a clear and skillfully modulated voice, then I come to acknowledge the great utility of this custom. Thus I vacillate between dangerous pleasure and healthful exercise. I am inclined, though I pronounce no irrevocable opinion on the subject, to approve of the use of singing in the church, so that by the delights of the ear the weaker minds may be stimulated to a devotional mood. Yet when it happens that I am more moved by the singing than by what is sung, I confess myself to have sinned wickedly, and then I would rather not have heard the singing. See now what a condition I am in. Weep with me and weep for me, those of you who can so control your inward feelings that good results always come forth. As for you who do not act this way at all, such things do not concern you. But do thou, O Lord my God, give ear, look and see, and have mercy upon me, and heal me, thou in whose sight I am become an enigma to myself. This itself is my weakness. End of Book 10, Chapters 23-33 through 33.